Hello, in this video I want to have a look at Egypt, but we'll be jumping around a little bit, but especially the the geology of the place and how it would, in many cases, assist the quarrymen and the stone workers in here. So it, there we see the famous Sphinx, um, uh, it's called Khafre's Pyramid, there in the back. Here is an older picture of a Sphinx and how it had long been buried in sand, and we see the Great Pyramid here in uh, behind it. But an interesting feature of, of the Giza Plateau and the limestone there are these layers, which is not an unusual strata, so different layers of the... So it's all limestone, but it's been set at different layers. And so there are different qualities of limestone. So there's some soft limestone, but there's also some very hard uh, limestone. And you can see in the Sphinx these geological layers. So if you've ever been through, a, like driving down a freeway and have ever like cut through the mountain, you can see these layers of stone. Whenever you see an exposed rock face, you can often see these different layers um, and how well relevant they are. So just a close-up of a sphinx's head. And again, we get an... So this uh, portion is a, a restoration work and well, what's generally, you know, uh, the recarved sphinx head, but uh, let's leave that to the side. And the geology is the important part. So we see these layers, we can just you know, get an idea and highlight them. So these are stone layers of stone which would so when you're cutting these stone they're going to greatly actually greatly assist you in your task if you're cutting blocks for instance these blocks in the background we also get a an idea of uh, geology in these different layers of stone close up there but uh, while we're here so this is the sphinx enclosure and we see these so we see the rump of the Sphinx there, and we see the enclosure wall. So the, basically, the, the, up to the shoulders of the Sphinx was once ground, uh, stone, and the body of the Sphinx was carved down into the rock. But what we have there is also, so not just these, uh, the layers of stone, and uh, so, you know, softer stone, harder stone, etc. You can even see it in the uh, erosion patterns there. But also these erosion marks, it's worth mentioning if you're, you know, most people I'm sure must be aware by now, but uh, Robert Schock uh, pointed out that these erosion marks point to uh, the Sphinx being much older. Now I have a book called The Riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, it's by Paul Jordan and it's pretty much a, you know, a cheerleading for the establishment. And they go to some, so for instance they point out, uh, uh, for instance Robert Bouval and others and tend to well, poo-poo it. I think it's a very biased book in that way. But the, also there are uh, is basically a whole chapter on these erosion marks and one of the explanations that they, so the Sphinx was buried in sand and so what they call the wet sand theory. Now this wet sand theory, at least as I believe, I could be wrong, is, is proposed by an Egyptologist, not a geologist, based on some proven geology, you know, some, you know, it is not completely invented. However, there are some pointers. So basically, the theory goes: the pyramid, uh, sorry, the Sphinx was buried in sand. There is rain that you know, there, rain does happen in Cairo, or so some flooding, so that the water, um, you know, um, just a bit like at the beach. You know, if you dig down enough, there's a bit of moisture in there that through this and uh, salt caused this erosion. But it, well, again, as has been pointed out, that that would cause a more erratic form, not this downward shape you know what you can see you know even for a non-geologist you can see that this is running down it's not a, the wet sand theory really doesn't account for that and also might be pointed out that many sites on the on the plateau around you can see it in the older photos were buried in sand up until about the 1850s 1900s when excavation really began and they don't this pattern of erosion should be you know if they were all dated to 2500 BC. It should be everywhere really around that place. Now, if we go to, let's uh, exit Street View. Um, well, you can go to Google Earth and it will tell you, okay, that's freezing up, but you can get an idea of the elevation of the, um, of where the Sphinx is. Now, the Sphinx and, and some similarly eroded temples are lower on the plateau, but there are other sites dated to roughly the same period that just don't have that erosion marks but okay that I'm, I'm getting on a diff, different theme but still worth mentioning so uh, but what I mean so there we see the Sphinx but the point is is these layers of stone that uh, it can clearly be seen it's just you know if you've ever seen a uh, rock face it's one of those uh, continuing themes now 
just under the shadow of the uh, pyramids there, we also see this quarry where you can see the blocks where they've been left over. And uh, they're not all the same, and that's a key feature because the blocks and the pyramid are not all identical. But what is it relevant is you can start to see again these layers of limestone, varying quality of, of limestone. Very so, uh, if, if you pour vinegar on limestone, you can dissolve it. Uh, so even a, a basically acid wool um, and uh, bases as well, but yes, more important. Look, acid will dissolve limestone. They actually, do it relatively quickly, depending on the quality of the limestone. But that's for another video. So there we see, and there we get an idea of the of the strata. So you can even see the different colours and the different rates of erosion um, that happen there. The softer limestone, you know, erodes relatively quickly. Acid rain, in, especially from the industrial age and Cairo uh, pollution, etc has accelerated this and so there has been quite you know recent erosion has happened much faster than uh, these ancient um, erosion okay. okay why this is important is because well it would for the people quarrying these blocks presuming these blocks were used for the pyramids we really don't know without a time machine but uh, it would greatly assist in them cutting so they would have to cut the trenches lengthwise uh, like across and you know along but they wouldn't uh, removing the stone the top and the bottom by simply you could even get a trace of the, the strut so these stones basically end at the strata so we have you know then another layer then another layer and so using the naturally occurring you know, uh, cracks and layers we can remove the stone much quicker this would greatly speed up the process of removing the stone uh, we can also see evidence of this for instance at this other famous site Baalbek now that's so very underneath the tip there we can see this line now this has been described as a laser cut or, or, or a cut well even by the color of the stone you get an idea that it's actually a separate layer and I'll po post a link to uh, Trash Arts Portsmouth he's done a series called Rethinking Baalbek is done rethinking Egypt, Peru. Now he's, well, you know, uh, has a differing opinions than, than to mine. But what it is fantastic about his work is that he has a very critical eye. And so there are these repeated. So he's still on, let's, you know, on the different track than what I would consider myself. However, yeah, he has a very critical eye and even checks things. And and just by using a building square, he shows that a lot of these things that are said, actually not correct, but. Uh, as he points out in this video, link in the description. So this piece of film is he follows that there is a, a, a crack, a line that follows throughout. So the saw mark, the alleged saw mark seen here, uh, we can see this uh, crack line follows, and it's well, it's basically a, a, a strata line. It's a one of these layers of sedimentation that can be seen in the stone and. Again, quarrymen until recent times and, and going back to ancient times, this is, would have worked this out. It saves a lot of effort. And so again, just those, uh, some of the strata line there that can see in the Sphinx. Now, I was always curious as to the angle of these stones and I had a different idea. I thought maybe it had to do with get, get, you know, getting them set up to, to for the move. But as he points out, it actually f matches the, the, the strata lines here in the natural, in the quarries, the natural lines there. It's not a, the, the stone is not set vertically, unlike uh, what we can see in uh, back in uh, on the Giza Plateau, where the lines are uh, basically horizontal. Uh, this line is at an angle, and that matches the the we can so we get a sense here. We can see these lines um, in the stone there itself, and it's following those lines. Now, uh, according to you, I'm not sure. Yeah, but uh, if we project these across. I'm not sure if they directly match up. This is a course, screenshot from his video. Uh, however, because of uh, the jumble here, I would think, now again, this is uh, offering a, a, an idea rather, uh, you know, it would really require someone who's knowledgeable in this particular quarry site rather than, and who wants to study it genuinely. But firstly, so cutting these blocks in this way is just a very smart, uh, simple, you know, work smart, not hard. And it's just like splitting a, st uh, a piece of wood. You know, you can split by going along the grain. You can split a piece of wood very, very easily. If you want to cut a across the grain 
with a with a with an axe or a saw, it's much harder work. And so you just if you can you can split a block with a hammer, but it takes a lot more effort with a saw to cut across the grain. And this is the same principle used in stonework. Smart stone masons, you know, they they can they can feel the stone, they can hear the stone, and this is how they work. Now, if this doesn't match up, I would again just suspecting. I don't really know the sites. So I couldn't say definitively. Definitively, but again, if you've seen uh, a stone face, this type of crack and split between them again is a you know relatively common. So this might explain uh, that. Uh, I'm not sure if this corner projects out. And again, based on his uh, photo, and you would have to use a bit of survey gear to get it accurate. Accurate, but this type of feature could be the explanation. So now we move backwards and we go back to Egypt and to the pyramids and the blocks there and we see some of this uh, quarry site and again so these blocks do match the size of on the, the pyramids themselves and the height of these uh, natural lines, these layers also match the, uh, the height of each course in the pyramid. So by cutting using the strata you save yourself a lot of effort and you, can, you, you almost effectively have, a, you know, especially here, a, a nice line to begin with. It would only take a bit of uh, shaving from the top to get you these nice blocks. But there's a bit more to the pyramid. So as is rightly said, so we have some of the surviving casing stones and this is some really amazing stonework where, you know, you, you can't fit a needle in there. And just behind the casing stones, we have these exposed layer. And even there, we see some really brilliant uh, stonework, but um, where it's often said you can't fit a you know piece of paper in between these amazing stuff. However, if we do look, you know, just so underneath the casing stones we have this layer of stone, but underneath them we have another layer, and we start to get an idea that this precision masonry is not the defining feature of the interior of the pyramid. We have some places where we can peek inside what's beyond that layer, and there you go. Uh, we can see it in other pyramids as well, so the smooth casing stones on the outside are a jumble of stones on the inside, such as here is the Bent Pyramid. But again, so back to uh, the Great Pyramid, and again we get an idea, so a lot of this you can't fit a pin, well that's defining some parts, that's the outer layers of the stone, but then a little bit in we see that there are quite large gaps, still laid with great precision no doubt, however just it's not as every block uh, cut so the two point uh, two and a half million blocks that were cut it's not this precision cutting for every single block it's for the you know, it's huge amount of work let's not get put that at but it, it, the bulk of it is actually pointing at something much different to what is often said about the precision of the stone cuts there in the pyramid and if we look in a little bit further um, okay so what we have is actually there's quite a bit of gypsum mortar so it's not just they've taken essentially shortcuts and we can also see these irregular stones again on the inside it's not all these precision cuts the interior of the pyramid has these very irregular stones and gypsum mortar in there as well so the precision is there and it's there on the outside huge amount of stones no doubt however we go inside a little bit and we see what's not quite what is often said and we go a little bit further in and we see well they you know wouldn't call it a short well it is a shortcut but this in itself would now drastically reduce the amount of time it would take to construct them. So you're not just cutting these stones with precision. We also have, well, gypsum mortar to fill in the gaps, for instance, and irregular stones. So it's not what it's often said to be. Now, this same level of precision, across these ancient stone working cultures, we find this amazing precision. Now, the Parthenon would be one. Again, this whole place, you can't fit a needle into the gap. So this is not just to these other parts of the ancient world, but for instance, the column drums, as is one commentator says, oh, you can't, well, these column drums were so tight that they were airtight when they were placed on top of one another, and they had a wooden core. When they pulled the drums apart, they found this two and a half thousand year old cedar, which was still had the aroma of the wood in there. It was airtight. Uh, so again, even later cultures, which don't get the exposure, I believe they should, we're doing amazing precision stonework. Okay, so not only did the were these column drums so 
finely fitted together that they were able to essentially airtight seals to preserve this timber over two and a half thousand years. Uh, the, the whole Parthenon itself is actually, every piece is individually fitted and there are gentle curves throughout the structure itself. Now it's built of pentelic marble. Pentelic marble is essentially the equivalent of the limestone, including the more harder limestone of, of Egypt itself. So marble and uh, limestone are, are very comparable. Limestone is, uh, you know, well, even pentelic marble is not some, it's not talc, it just, uh, it's not uh, some sort of soft material. It is very, it's relatively hard. That's why people have these big, you know, lovely marble desktops as um, uh, kitchen tops and other things. So that's comparable to it as well. Now, uh, again, I'll do one on the Mohs hardness scale, but you need to be very, very careful when you hear references to this because it's not, you can't just look at a number on Mohs hardness scale and say because it's softer it can't be cut. It's just not that, it just doesn't work that way. It has to do with how different minerals scratch each other, not about how they can cut into each other because there are plenty of examples of softer materials cutting harder ones. But it's also, I'll put a link in the description as well to a video, Secrets of the Parthenon, because in this recent restoration, what they've done is they've fitted shattered bits of, of uh, stone and then fitted them together, three-dimensional fitting as well, using ancient techniques, not uh, modern laser scanning and laser cutting, but uh, some very, very simple known ancient tools, and they're able to fit erratic, shattered stone together, which is considerably harder than fitting stone together with a, uh, with a uniform smooth surface. It's still very hard to fit these things together. It does take amazing amount of skill, but by, by looking at the ancient techniques, by looking at the masons as they practice it, looking at traditional masonry techniques, we find that a lot of these impossibilities are actually uh, very, not only very possible, but still being practiced today and uh, you, you can, uh, are literally being used and can be recreated to achieve some uh, amazing things. That link will also be in the description, Secrets of the Parthenon. Fantastic documentary because it details a lot of other things and shows how even the Greco-Roman architects would, were achieving amazing, amazing technology, well, not, I wouldn't call it technology, it's a, a set of knowledge, a set of skill, and they're able to achieve these things which again are ignored um, by certain areas because, I, I don't know, reasons I suppose, but because again, it challenges some of these uh, ancient mysteries, which is a, essentially an industry at this point. It's also worth noting, I'll put the link to this uh, blog description, Joel, Joel Clark, and he points out he's showing stones close up. of Not only these stones, which are amazingly fit, but also the pyramid itself is not all these straight, you know, it's surveyed with great skill, but there's a, a, an added level, just like the Parthenon, there's this added level of difficulty where there are these, where they're fitted individually, and we can see these slight uh, undulations, so this in itself points to, again, the given the, the uh, accuracy of the survey, again, the, the accuracy is wonderful, but it is a bit overplayed, because you can look at Roman aqueducts and other, uh, uh, other stoneworking cultures, you can find there's actually a higher level of accuracy in regards to stonework and surveying than there is in the Great Pyramid. Again, it's a little bit of a religion in, in some circles. No, don't take this as a fantastic, this is an amazing building. Let's not take anything away from it. But I think we need to be level-headed and look at the the evidence which goes for the re-examining history theory as well as that uh, re-examining some of the so-called unexplained mysteries, which, well, there are some convenient um, explanation, well not just convenient, proven explanations for some of these things. For instance, these stones are, are one to six tonne. Now that is a tiny, tiny weight for even just by uh, using a wooden frame and uh, a trucker's hitch, you, uh, a few people can lift this weight. So these weights, or Wally Wallington, I'll put that, some. I'll try to remember to put those links in the description. If you know how to use a rope, and uh, and over some basic principles of what's called mechanical advantage, you can a few people can lift large weights very very quickly. So there are the past is full of mysteries yet to be answered. Yes, but there are clues and even some answers. And for that, I'm going to put the link in the description. Uh, uh, English translation of the first century Roman architect Marco Vitruvius, whose book well details not just the aesthetics of architecture, but also the, the various machinery 
simple machinery, simple tools which overcome a lot of these so-called impossible lifts and answers and not only in a theoretical sense but also in a practical sense because we do see evidence of especially uh, in in Rome and uh, Constantinople in Alexandria these Roman lift and movement technologies which are detailed and still be still form the basis of lifting technology to this day so that link will be in the description um, as well so there is uh, you know, yeah, again, there is actually a lot of evidence out there to not only for the mystery and things that we need to re-examine, but there also are p not only practical theoretical answers, but also proven traditional still in practice by uh, traditional masons and, and even up until before the mechanical age, a lot of these things, again, were very well known, very well recorded, and again, just unfortunate that uh, there is a tendency to protect uh, the team rather than to look at you know at the actual collection of individual evidence and the contrary evidence as well and so we need to do this and we can see yeah so this is just one example i'm going to do some uh, more in regards to this um, because we do need to re-examine history i believe in my personal belief but i don't think we should be doing it uh, in a uh, us versus them dogmatic way and I don't think we should be doing it by making claims which are not only unsubstantiated but clearly false in some cases and looking to the simple solution rather than immediately going to uh, tech you know high tech because it's yeah so okay just say for example it's often said uh, high tech machinery so it, it's scoffed at that maybe they had access to steel this is impossible yet we're, we we a lot of people can immediately go to high technology and so what were these m machines made out of if not for, so we, oh they couldn't use a stone chisel but we i can see them using a, a high pressure laser gun water jet etc this is quite frankly illogical you know uh, if they can achieve high tech machinery isn't there not an intermediary step what did they make it out of woven um papyrus or something where did these machine where where was this what was this machinery made out of what were the hoses and all the bits and pieces and the complex you know the motors and etc the power source what was it what did it come from well these answers need to you know you need to if you're going to make a statement like that you believe you need to make evidence uh for those statements but anyway uh i'll put a bunch of other links in the description again this um trash arts portsmouth and the rethinking uh extras he does some you know again very critical eye again and he's more on the the side i would not lean towards however uh, he does examine and look at the facts and the details in a way which I think is sorely missing from those people on his supposed team. Um, again, you know, let's look for, for the evidence and not for fiction. And again, all links in the description and cheerio and have a good one.